Hello, uh, everyone. Welcome to UCL Lunch Hour Lecture on Can False Memory Evidence Sway a Trial? Our speaker for today is Dr. Julia Shaw, who's an honorary research associate in the Division of Psychology and Language uh, Science at UCL. Dr. Shaw has done extensive research on memory in legal contexts. And in 2016, she published her best selling book, The Memory Illusions Remembering. Uh, remembering, Forgetting and the Science of False Memory. She's also the host of the award-winning weekly B BBC podcast, Bad People, co-hosted with comedian Sophie Hagen. If you haven't listened to it, I do, and it's very interesting. Dr Shaw trains lawyers in how to better understand the limitations of memory evidence, and she consults as an expert on legal cases, particularly cases involving historical allegations. Before we begin, I wanted to let you know that we will have some time at the end of the lecture for questions. These can be submitted at any point during Julia's talk by going to Slido, that's sli.do, if you put that into your browser, and entering the event uh, code, which is hashtag UCL trial. I'll now hand over to Julia for her talk. It's so nice to be here and to be able to talk about something I'm very passionate about, which is communicating science in practical settings. And uh, so if you're interested in how memory works, I will be talking um, briefly about memory and false memory and why it's so easy, easy for our brains to fabricate you know, experiences and memories of things that never actually happened. And these can include highly emotional events. But really what I'm gonna get into in this talk is some examples of cases that I've worked on as an expert witness, bringing false memory evidence into the courtroom and trying to apply what we do in the scientific community to specific cases. And I also really wanna talk for the first time ever actually about the moral implications of being an expert witness on this particular issue, which I'm sure some of you are here thinking about because of recent news coverage of false memory evidence that has been presented in a very big trial. So I and you have probably been thinking about this more over the last few months than maybe previously, and I want to talk about my thoughts on the ethics of being a false memory expert. But we'll get to that. So I'm going to share my screen, and let's get started. So as I said, um, the question is going to be, should false memory evidence sway a trial? And I mean, in some questions it's right, can it, should it? That's what we're gonna talk about. Because I think, yes, of course, false memory evidence can sway a trial. And then the question is whether it should, both from a scientific point of view, is it strong enough? You know, should the way that we talk about memories in the courtroom, should is there enough of an evidence base to bring this kind of stuff into a courtroom in the first place? And once it's there, how should it be used? And is it a good thing? And is it always a good thing? But let's start with memory. So what actually is a memory? Uh, now, most of you will probably be familiar with these because we all have them, but in terms of the brain, there's this idea sometimes falsely that brains live in what's called the hippocampus, which is the middle part of the brain, which looks apparently there's, it looks like two little seahorses. Uh, but I think that they, they'd be funny looking seahorses. They're just structures of the brain that are quite central, but memories don't live in one part of the brain. And I think this helps to understand why when we experience something, it feels more like we're experiencing the event as we lived it the first time. And so you can, you know, re-experience sensations like how something smelled or how it tasted, what it felt like, what you saw. And so these multi-sensory details are accessing potentially parts of the brain that were originally also used in their creation. And so you can almost, you know, have those sensations as if you're re-experiencing them, you're reliving them. Now, what's curious from a memory perspective is that you can have similar kinds of experiences that, you know, you feel like you're re-experiencing something, even if you didn't actually experience that thing in the first place. Now, false memories are memories of things that never actually happened or that didn't happen in the way that you remember. And so they can be what are called partial or complete. A partial false memory is what we would colloquially call making a mistake. So, you know, you're talking about how you were on an adventure with a friend, maybe you had a night out, 
and you get a detail wrong. You say it wasn't so-and-so with us and your friend goes, no, they weren't. And so in that moment, what you've done is you've inserted a person into your memory who wasn't actually there. Now that would be a partial false memory because the event, the experience actually happened, but not with that particular person, not with that detail, if you will. Although of course, calling a person a detail, once we get into criminal justice settings becomes more important, but for a night out, doesn't really matter. Now, that's a partial false memory. Now, if we're talking about full false memories, it can be the entire night out, the entire experience wasn't actually experienced. And the way that we get there is through often um, a combination of factors of psychological processes that make it possible for our brain to imagine how things could be or how they could have been. And then basically through these complex processes of imagination to convince ourselves, usually unintentionally, so this isn't sort of lying to yourself, but to convince ourselves that we actually experience those particular things, and then subsequently to think that we're remembering them. And again, this is an experience that's quite common. I, for example, have false memories of my own childhood. I have a memory of my grandfather picking me up and twirling me around, and it turns out that's an impossible memory. But in my version of it, when I remember it or feel like I'm remembering it, I can picture exactly what he looks like, exactly what it feels like, and exactly where we were, even though none of it actually happened. So these things are really quite common. And there's a lot of research on false memories and memories in general and how fallible and creative our brains are when it comes to the process of remembering. There's also quite a lot of research showing that just because we're really confident in a memory doesn't mean it's true. And so things that we rely on as individuals to say, you know, I'm confident, I'm sure this happened, are things like having a lot of details. But the problem is that having a lot of details, because our brains are these beautiful creative organs, isn't necessarily the you know, a sign that it actually did happen. So we need to be very careful not assuming that someone who's confidently talking about an experience with lots of detail, that that necessarily happened, even if that person seems to believe it did. Now, there's another piece to this, which is that it, people are quite bad at detecting lies as well. So there's basically three things, certainly legally, that or at least three things legally that are important. One is, you know, an accurate description of something that happened that is, let's say, a memory, a reliable memory. Then you've got a false memory that's either partial or complete. So someone gets a detail wrong, and that can be an important or an irrelevant detail, or they can have a full false memory. So remembering something that didn't happen, but they think it did. And then there's the final option, which is lying. And that is really difficult to differentiate. So in some ways, false memories and lies have in, in common that they are descriptions of things that didn't happen. But the difference is how the person themselves feels. With the false memory, the person themselves thinks it's real. They think it's something they're accessing about their own past and they're not intentionally making it up. With a lie, you're intentionally making it up. And that's something that the person themselves knows, but for experts, for people who are looking at accounts, it can be virtually impossible to tell the difference. So there's lots of complications here when we're talking about trying to figure out whether something is a memory, whether something feels real to the individual and whether something's accurate. Now, added to that is that our memories are constantly changing. So in addition to the creativity of our brain to think and imagine things as they could have been, the memories that you're accessing are not necessarily the original memory that you created. They're typically the last version of that memory. So if something emotionally, you know, something emotional happens to you and you're describing that repeatedly. Now, if you are a witness to a crime, for example, you will probably repeatedly tell that story to multiple people. Now that's not inherently a bad thing, but what it means is that depending on to whom you're telling your story and how they react to the different details in your story, or whether they perhaps add their own details. Let's say there's another witness who saw something slightly different than you did or remember slightly different than you do. If they're adding and telling that story to you, it means that your story can shift and morph over time. And every time you tell that story, it has that potential to be influenced by what we would probably refer to as social processes. So there's that social dynamic that's happening when we're telling a story and someone is listening and responding to it. And that is consolidating, but also potentially changing our stories. And then when we're sitting in a courtroom and recalling that same story, the problem is that we can no longer differentiate 
which pieces have been modified and which ones were the original memory. And that's a problem for justice. And so something you'll hear repeatedly from memory experts is that contemporaneous evidence, so evidence from as close as possible to when an event occurred, ideally before someone has talked to other people about it, is going to be the highest quality evidence. And we'll get to that in terms of how we try to access that and how, as a memory expert, I'm also trying to help people record these things contemporaneously. Because the thing is that you should assume at all times, even if a memory is important, even if a situation is something where you're saying, I need to remember this in vivid detail later, this is going to be important, which again, if you're witnessing a crime be committed, you might well be thinking that to yourself. It doesn't mean that you are going to be able to remember that in the vivid detail that you have told yourself you need to remember. So expect that you're going to forget. This sounds really negative, but it's a very realistic approach to, again, these creative brains that we have and we need to work with them. And they're not made for precision. They're not made to keep, keep and capture things as sort of solid networks in the brain forever. They're made to adapt and adjust. And the social process of remembering is part of our shared humanity. It's part of making sense of the world around us together as a group of humans. So that's, it's a good thing that there are social processes that impact our remembering, I would say. But it's not a good thing if you're trying to get to a factual description of what happened. So write it down. If something's really important and you need to remember it, assume you're going to forget, record it independently of your beautiful creative brain. So memories are constantly changing, but that also means that as a memory expert, there's lots that I can potentially look at. The kinds of things that influence our memories are not just social processes, or you could say not just IRL social processes, digital social processes also play a role. And this is something that is increasingly becoming relevant, both because we're more likely, perhaps during things like lockdowns than ever, to communicate with one another via the internet and specifically via text messaging and other kinds of digital communication. Now, the good thing about that is that those kinds of communications are time-stamped and they're often accessible later. And I don't know if you've done this, but I certainly have, even in terms of trying to monitor when I had, for example, COVID, I went back and searched my WhatsApps to see when I texted people that I had my first symptoms. Now, that is a really good, independent, reliable record, I would say, because you have that contemporaneous time-stamped sort of feature that comes with your WhatsApps. Now, there's also a negative side, which means that, well, negative certainly if you're worried about these things and what you're writing in your WhatsApps, because, I mean, I think people have been saying this for years, but I'll say it again. Don't write anything in an email or a WhatsApp or online that you wouldn't want read aloud in a courtroom because that's what happens. I see a lot of these kinds of text messages submitted as evidence now, and they can tell a good story, they can tell a bad story, but there's certainly the record of the time and it's relied upon heavily. From a memory perspective, it's a good thing for me because as long as someone has reliably recorded something at the time, it's still better than assuming that their most recent version is the closest to reality. So there's the good and the bad of digital, digital tools. Good because we're creating, I think, more contemporaneous records automatically. Bad because there's also the influence of communicating with people online, just like in real life. If you're telling a story to someone on WhatsApp, you might also want to embellish certain features or leave out certain features of a story. And that can happen quite automatically or it can happen intentionally, but that can also distort things later on. Never mind the influence of things like the news or Twitter or other people, especially for collective memories, things that lots and lots of people have witnessed or been part of, those can all contaminate how we remember things as well. So there's lots of potential sources of what is called misinformation that can distort or contaminate our worldview and distort or contaminate our individual memories. And the internet is making that group that can have that influence much wider. But again, from a memory standpoint, I think it's mostly a good thing that we have more access to contemporaneous records. There's also another piece to this, which is that memories can be implanted. Now, the context in which I'm most interested in these kinds of processes is in not just a lab setting, 
which is what I've, so I've implanted false memories of criminal events, specifically of attacking someone, so assault, assault with a weapon or theft with police contact. Now that's a study that if you're interested in, there's lots about online and you can go to my website, drjuliashaw.com to access a PDF version of that study. It basically showed that 70% of participants had given false confessions saying that they committed a crime that they didn't commit and that they could remember in quite a vivid detail for some more than others, but still in varying levels of vivid detail, exactly what happened. And they could remember, as I alluded to before, multi-sensory details. So they said that they could remember what it smelled like, what it sounded like, what it felt like to be there, their motive for attacking this person. And that is a demonstration of how through leading and suggestive interview practices, in a controlled environment, you can convince people that they did things that never happened, including negative autobiographical, important emotional events that are relevant for legal settings. In terms of why I did that, I wanted to see what you can do wrong, basically all of the what not to do is of interviewing. And I wanted to throw them all into one study. And uh, in, in effect, what I wanted to warn is police officers and people who are doing memory interviews and show, well, I ended up finding, so I was able to show how easily misled people can be in these kinds of settings. So memories can be implanted intentionally by researchers in, com in controlled settings. They can also be implanted, and I would say this is much more common, unintentionally by helpful people, people who want to and don't maybe understand how memory works and really want to help. And that can include therapists who are overly eager and maybe not critical enough of memories and of accounts. That can include social workers who are, again, maybe making assumptions that negative things must have happened, or police officers who are have an, an assumption about what happened in a particular instance and are using leading or suggestive interview practices unintentionally in the process of trying to get at information and again, this is, I think, often a result of not knowing enough about how memory works rather than out of malice. Although very occasionally I see things where I go, hmm. <laughs> seems pretty intentionally leading, but that's uh, again, something as an expert, that's where I come in and look at police interviewing tactics and sometimes I'm more critical than others. So these memories can be implanted and that can include again, partial or complete false memories. And that is usually when I get asked to join a case is when there's a question, was there a memory that was implanted here? And potentially was there a, a consequence of this? And that can be a psychological consequence. Like it, if this person thinks that this negative thing happened and now they have severe anxiety or depression, could that be from a false memory or does it have to be from a real experience? And so I'll get asked about not just whether a memory could be true or false, but also whether the consequences that someone has could be also from a true or a false memory. And so there's, there's layers to the expertise there. So part two, I'm gonna list three cases to show you how my work looks basically, and then we'll get into the ethics of it. So three examples, the first one, cause I think when people think about false memories and when they think about false memory evidence in courtrooms, I think, automatically, certainly more seasoned lawyers and judges and people in the legal profession will think about historic child sexual abuse. And the reason for that is that in the 1990s in particular, there was a large amount of controversy around a number of memories or alleged memories that people were having about really extreme situations. And the question was, were these real? Were these allegations of extremely horrific deeds real? And that led to a number of um, instances where it turned out that child, both children themselves were being interviewed in leading and suggestive ways and uh, saying impossible things, frankly. And yet they were landing individuals in prison. And so the question was sort of, how did we get here? And then there was another piece, which was that there was a book that came out, which said that in a therapeutic setting, someone had remembered being horribly satanically, ritualistically abused, and that this had slowly come out in what we would now consider a very leading type of therapy. And that was then also heavily critiqued by researchers who said, this may not have happened. And so the sort of 
1990s spawned, I think, a huge amount of thinking about false memories, specifically of historical events and historical events, or what we now would call non-recent events, being anything from five to 50 to 100 years ago. 100 is unlikely, but basically as far back as ideally the perpetrator is still alive. And so that can pop up, I think, in people's brains when they think about the use of false memory experts in court. And that is a case or the kind of case that I get asked to work on, but I also get asked to work on other kinds of cases. For example, example one, a couple of years ago, I worked on a case in Canada and I was asked to comment on a case where a police officer had done a, a raid on a house. So he was part of a team. They'd done a raid on this, this particular house and inside the house, there were two people. And everybody knew that there are two people inside this house because it's can't, they checked it beforehand. Now, the question was, for, for me, is that this police officer who'd gone around the back of the house had seen somebody open the door quickly and he got shot by the individual who opened the back door and then closed the back door again. The question was, which of the two people in the house had shot this particular police officer? Now, initially, the police officer, understandably, he survived, by the way, but he was uh, rushed to the hospital. He had a very emotional, very, of course, uh, a very sort of strong response to the situation. And for many, many months, he said, I just don't know. I couldn't really see him. I couldn't really see his face. Then the police officer for PTSD, again, totally understandable, of course, he just got shot, went to therapy. And in this therapy, again, told his therapist repeatedly, I don't remember, but I really, really want to remember who it was because that would help in the prosecution of this particular individual or these individuals. And I was asked to say, you know, A, is it possible that he could not remember? But then there was a twist right at the end. This police officer said right before it was supposed to go into the courtroom, the day of runs up to the lawyers and says, I remember, I remember it was, and then said one of the names. And I remember it clearly. And then there was, of course, the question, is it possible to conveniently, if you will, the day of a trial actually remember who it was? And now I think it probably doesn't take an expert to, to say that's a highly problematic situation. And there's a lot of motivated remembering this in this moment. And yet I'm convinced that this police officer, they weren't lying. They thought that they had, in fact, unlocked this lost memory. But I unfortunately had to say that the combination of motivated remembering, imagination exercises that were used in the post-traumatic stress counseling, which were themselves fine, it's just that they also involved, of course, going over the situation. And it wasn't hypnosis. It wasn't anything, you know, some, anything that we would inherently consider problematic or consider more problematic from a memory standpoint. It was just that he was repeatedly going over that situation. And eventually he said, this is what happened. And then there's another piece of this, which is that he, of course, knew what this person looked like. So if anyone is going to describe what someone's face looks like, if that person has already seen photos of the two people in the house, they're more likely, I would say, to potentially take one of those photos and think about it so much that they feel like it's part of their memory. And so this would be a par partial false memory, right? This is an important partial false memory in a legal context where he has said, this is the face, this is what happened. In the end, my role as an expert was basically just to write a report for the court and that particular statement saying, I remember now who it was, was, was ruled inadmissible. So this is where expert, expert reports and expert work can involve sort of not actually going into the court, but rather advising the court on whether or not particular pieces of evidence are reliable enough to be admitted as evidence in court. Because of course, to a jury hearing I remember exactly who it was and I remember his face is an incredibly compelling piece of evidence, even if it's an unreliable piece of memory. So that's an example of where a false memory expert is useful because we can come in and say, here's the processes that can lead, as far as we know from research context, to exactly this kind of thing happening. Now, what I didn't say is this is definitely a false memory. I would never say that, or this is definitely a real memory, or this is a lie. 
I don't say any of those things. What I say is here's some research that matches what we're seeing in this particular case. And basically I list a number of, I don't call them this in my reports, but I could colloquially call them red flags. So I say, here's a parallel, here's some research, here's what happened in this case. Here's some more research, here's what happened in this case. We've seen these kinds of processes lead to false memories in research contexts. I then present that or give that in a report to the lawyers who then give it to a judge or jury typically. Um, and then the idea is that that informs the decision. Again, I'm not saying this is a false memory. I'm just saying, careful, this, there are problems here. Example two, did that happen 10 years ago? So here's something, again, that's more related to what people probably think of when they think of false memory evidence in courtrooms. They think of historic cases. Now, historic cases don't need to involve historic abuse. They can involve other kinds of things. But the primary piece usually within these historic allegations is that it's based almost exclusively or, or exclusively on people's memories. Because typically, if there's other contemporaneous evidence, physical evidence, there's video footage, if there's other stuff, you're unlikely or much less likely to hire a false memory expert. The cases in which you would bring in someone like me is when the biggest or the most important or the only piece of evidence is someone's memory or multiple memories. And even more so you'd bring me in if those memories don't match up to one another. Now, a defendant saying, I'm not guilty, that didn't happen, is something that a lot of defendants say. So that's not in and of itself necessarily a particularly useful memory to look at. But if you've got, for example, two witnesses who are saying different things, that's interesting and that's useful. If you've got a victim or an alleged victim who is saying particular things that don't match up to what other people say they said to them. So if there was a disclosure closer to the time and let's say someone's mother says, you said something very different 10 years ago about that thing that happened 20 years ago, that's interesting as well. So people's memories and also people's memories of store of tellings are important parts of sort of uncovering whether or not there might be problems with a historical allegation. So did that happen 10 years ago, did that happen 20 years ago, did that happen 50 years ago? Did it happen on a massive scale? So I've been involved in cases that involve, you know, one individual, one, you know, one defendant, one witness slash victim. Um, of course, legally we call victims who also witnesses, they're within the group of witnesses. Um, and so, you know, or, and I've also dealt with cases where there's, you know, 50 defendants or 50 people who are in being investigated and hundreds of people who are making allegations. So these can be small, these can be big, but the same thing happens. You basically have to look through all the different factors that can influence that particular memory or those particular memories. With large cases, when there are lots and lots of witnesses, problems are introduced in addition to the already, you know, as I said, that the, the problems with the brain being able to already create and imagine things as they could have been and distorting our memories through social processes. When there are really big cases, say there's 50 witnesses, the problem is, or a good thing is, if you will, that there's often support groups for situations. And so people will, group, you know, meet each other and hang out and talk about and work through and process their shared experience, which is a really important thing potentially for their mental health. But from a memory standpoint, it is a nightmare because it's really, really hard to disentangle whose memory is whose and whether people have contaminated each other's memories. And so it can make it very difficult also for police to figure out what actually happened. So that's the main difference I would say between sort of a big case and a small case when it comes to the number of witnesses. But other than that, the process is pretty similar. It's just that in one, you're doing it multiple times and in the other, you're doing it just the once or twice to look at a memory. In terms of the things that I look for in historical allegations. So if you're thinking back, you're saying, okay, there's this thing I think happened 20 years ago. I mean, this is a question I guess we could all ask ourselves. How do I know? How could I be sure that that thing I'm picturing is something that actually happened? And the answer to that is there are a couple of things that you can look for that make it more likely that that memory has been able to be contaminated. Does that make sense? So basically what I'm trying to say is 
we definitely shouldn't just throw out all memories. Not all memories are so far from what actually happened to be unreliable, even if they're old, even if they happened a long time ago or the experiences related to them happened a long time ago. But there are some things that make it more likely or are risk factors for having a false memory that's either partial or complete. And those include leading interviews like those that I conduct in my research where I lead people down a path and I'm basically fishing for information and I'm introducing information like saying you assaulted someone tell me about that you were in a certain place tell me about that imagine that what would that have been like so there's leading interviews that can basically push people to to imagine things as they could have been or even just to say maybe you're trying to be a good witness and you saw something that happened and someone says didn't you see that he was holding a gun and you go, yes. And that's enough that the next time you answer that interview, you might volunteer. And then I saw his gun, even though perhaps in the original instance, you didn't see a gun, or at least you don't remember one. The problem is again, because of that sort of retelling in those social processes, by the time you get again into a courtroom potentially, or into a police environment where you're giving a formal statement, you might now think, oh, I remember the gun. And you've You've built it into, you've baked it into your story and it feels real to you now. And again, you don't have access to that original version, which didn't include the gun. So that can be a problem. So leading interviews is something I always look for. Luckily in the United Kingdom, interviews have gotten better and better. And I'm actually seeing this in my work in that police interviews, especially what are called ABE interviews. So achieving best evidence interviews, which are based on something called the cognitive interview, which is an evidence-based interview technique, which basically starts with very open questions. Tell me everything you can remember. And then ask probing questions about specific details in the wording used by the person who's telling the story. So the person themselves might say, I saw a red van and then tell more about the story. The investigator says, oh, that might be interesting, says, tell me, uh, you mentioned a red van. Can you tell me more about that? So it's trying to be very close to what the person is saying without introducing any new information. And that is, I think, being used more and more effectively and people are being trained on it better. And so these sort of leading interviews in the UK are becoming less likely. But it's not just in formal interview settings that people can be led to remember or think about things. It can be first contact with police officers, which you might get on say body worn cameras. You might have that first conversation between a witness or anybody and, and, uh, and the police. And so you might have a more unfiltered, maybe more unstructured setting there, which can introduce new details. You might have a counselor or a therapist who's brought in very quickly to help. Again, can introduce problems. Co-witnesses can introduce problems. Even family and members and friends who are trying to help can introduce problems by asking leading questions or by pushing people to remember things that maybe they didn't really remember because they really want to know. They can trying to be helpful. This isn't malicious, but it can contaminate the memory nonetheless. This can also lead to suggestion. So again, perhaps saying to someone, you must be very upset by this because, or maybe did you see this? Or maybe did X happen? And that can introduce emotional or other pieces where you're assuming basically that something must have happened and then it becomes part of the memory subsequently. Finally, something I always look for is memory growth. Typically, when we look at the trajectory of memories, memories are really quite strong immediately after something happened, obviously, right? So you've just experienced something. Your memory for the thing that you just experienced is probably as good as it's ever going to be. Now, from that point on, even the next day, you're probably going to have forgotten quite a lot of details. Now, those might not be important details, but there will be details nonetheless. And then over time, there's sort of... you forget more and more of it up to sort of a plateau where you sort of have a core construct of that memory. And you, unless you forget it entirely, kind of keep that with you, especially if you tell that story repeatedly. Now with false memories, because there's no memory to begin with, there's often a process where you start with no memory and then you slowly, slowly, slowly build details. And that isn't in and of itself a false memory, but it is certainly a sign that I think is related to false memory formation, is if you have someone who said, 
I didn't remember this or I didn't know this. And then over weeks or months or days um, or years, depending on the context, you're saying, I remembered one detail and another detail and another detail. And those got stronger and stronger over time. They got more and more consolidated and they got more and more complex. That to me is always a big red flag. And then the question is why? Why were there more details over time? And again, then we can look at the leading interviews and suggestion and other factors that might play a role. So that's a common case. Again, though, in terms of how to prevent this from happening, I would argue, record it, you know, write down memories that are important, write down details, record in as much detail as possible things that happened that you think are going to be important to remember later. Keep them on your phone, put it in a voice note, video it, make sure that it's outside of your brain because otherwise, you just don't know whether what you are remembering is close to what you, even close to your original memory, never mind to what actually happened. Finally, a short example uh, where I think a different context in which false memories can play a role and memories in general can play a role in terms of how we get memories out of people is in the workplace. So during Me Too, certainly the most recent wave of Me Too, there was a lot of talk about, you know, how can we be certain that something happened? How can we be certain what happened in a workplace in an inappropriate moment? How inappropriate was it? When did it happen? Where did it happen? With whom exactly did it happen? Were there witnesses? There are all these questions that are related to memories about highly emotional situations at work. And within those contexts, there's a bunch of things that can happen that make it seem like an account is less reliable and can make an account less reliable. Say I'm harassed at work. What's the first thing that's likely to happen is I'm going to have strong emotions, probably. Not necessarily, but probably. And then the next thing is in terms of sharing that with people, I might share it with my loved ones. I might share it with friends at work. I'm unlikely statistically to share it with human resources immediately or people who can actually take action. And one of the reasons for that is that it's really uncomfortable, probably, telling the story about what happened. Now, that leads me potentially to delay what I have to say or to not tell anyone at all. And delaying, as we also know, can encourage forgetting and can lead to more and more of these processes that can contaminate what I remember and the reliability of it. So what we want to do is we want to capture moments contemporaneously if they happen or when they happen at work. And the best way to do that is to give people tools to capture their memories as close as possible and in as much detail as possible at the time. Because inevitably, if you don't capture this, just like if you're a witness of a crime, just like if you're in other kinds of circumstances that are legally relevant, you're gonna say, I will remember this because this is really important and this is really emotional for me. And I, it's burned into my brain. And you're, if you say that to yourself, you're going to be wrong. And that's why we need to record that outside of our brains. And so a couple of years ago, I co-founded, well, a few years ago, actually now, I co-founded a company called Spot. And through Spot, I created a cognitive interview, artificial intelligence chatbot with the Spot team. And the Spot is still a, a tool that is available. And it's now we're now working with HR, um, the HR teams within various, also very big organizations and workplaces to try and, and get, empower people to speak up as close as possible to when things go wrong with as detailed and contemporaneous an account as possible. So Spot administers a small cognitive interview, basically asks you what happened in a text messaging anonymous space, and then you can send that report to HR and HR can respond. So you can initially be anonymous, but they can respond. And then eventually, if you want to launch a full investigation, you can then identify yourself when you feel comfortable doing so. But the most important thing is that we're capturing these memories as quickly as possible and sharing them in the most re reliable way possible so that you know workplaces can be improved and your life as, an, as a victim can be better. That's spot. We also work with the Bar, Bar Council. Oh, I said that very Canadian, the Bar, the Bar Council. Um, so lawyers in the UK also use this amongst themselves to report inappropriate workplace behavior. And that's something that there's a free tool available online as well. So if you go to talktospot.com, scroll down all the way to the bottom, you can talk to Spot as well, and you can create a report and download it for yourself if that's something you want to do. Just a thought. If, it ever, if you ever need it, there it is. So I'm trying to, as an applied psychologist, not just empower people 
and lawyers specifically to better understand memories, but I'm also trying to give people the tools so that they can better capture their own in a reliable way to avoid these kinds of pitfalls that then require someone like me to come in and say, this memory is problematic. Last part, and then we'll have some questions. Quickly, I wanna go over some ethics. Oh, this is, I'm nervous. Uh, this is a, something I've been thinking about more recently, and I find it very hard to think about the ethics of being a false memory expert. And specifically, the Ghislaine Maxwell case has brought up a lot of negative attention for false memory experts. And uh, specifically, Elizabeth Loftus, who was the expert on that case, who is the most influential false memory expert in the world, and also was one of the founders of the research in the field, has published, she's published so much on this topic and is incredibly knowledgeable. And yet in reporting of the case, the way that it was talked about was this false memory theory. It was talked about as if what she was saying in a courtroom, which she herself has been researching since the 70s, was somehow controversial. And I think people were conflating science and research that's controversial with a controversial case. And we need to be very careful and journalists need to be very careful, I think, in how they report these things and making sure that they separate the science from their distaste of for an individual who's on trial. So I'm just going to break down a couple of things so that you understand where I'm coming from. So first of all, why do memory experts get asked to be experts? Now, the reason I would say is that judges and jurors need to know how to evaluate the memory evidence they are presented with. We're not there to win a case. We're there to educate the judge and jury. We are there to say, here's some research. It might be useful. There you go. We also don't usurp the rule of the judge and jury. In other words, it's not our role to say whether someone's guilty or innocent. In fact, our evidence is inadmissible if we come too close to what's called the ultimate question. So this question of, of guilt. And so our reports say things like, here's some research, here's something in this case that mirrors it, as I described before. And we use terms like, it's possible that there's a false memory here, or it's improbable, or it's probable. We don't say even it's likely. We don't give a percentage because that would be meaningless. We don't say it's 90% likely that this memory is false. That would be meaningless. Instead, what we do is we bring a bunch of research to try to make it accessible and say, hey, you might need this to interpret this evidence that you are facing. Because if you don't have all the information, you're going to make worse decisions. And that's our role. In terms of defendants, so when I get asked to work on cases, in the UK certainly, and I'm pretty sure everywhere else in the world, there's no responsibility that I have as a researcher to take on any particular case. So that can be because of time, so I don't have enough time to take on a case, but it can be for any reason at all. So it can be that I'm asked to take on a high profile case, and this has, been, this has happened, and I've said no, not because I don't think that this person that doesn't deserve a fair trial because they do, but because I am worried about the consequences for me as an individual. Now there's lots of ethical debate here that we could get into around whether that's okay. So for lawyers in the UK, for example, there's something called the cab rank rule, which means that a barrister in the UK has to take on cases if they have the time to take them on, even if they disagree or don't like, if you will, the side that they've been assigned. And that's a really good thing for justice. It means that people are working multiple sides of multiple issues on a regular basis. And that doesn't happen with expert witnesses. So that's something I'm curious. You can also tweet me, so to say, do you think we should have the cab rank rule for expert witnesses? Why or why not? I like that I don't have to take on cases, but selfishly, that's because then I feel like I can avoid things that are going to get me coverage that I feel unable to psychologically deal with um, in the news, for example. So problematic defendants still deserve a fair trial, still sometimes see memory experts, even if we don't like them as people. And we need to tear apart this idea of thinking that memory evidence is the problem, which again, we're just educating the court. And why do we usually work for the defense? Because typically the people who need to show that there's potentially something wrong with, or that there, a memory isn't reliable, is the defense, not the prosecution. So that's the nature of an adversarial system. In places like, like the Netherlands, we're hired by the 
by the court and which I think is a much better role actually, but we're much more formally hired by the judge to inform the court in general and help in fact finding, which is different than an adversarial system where again, the accusation can be, you always work for the defense. And the answer to that is, yeah, because that's how the legal system works. On balance, in terms of how my process works to try and keep balance, I always write two lists for every case that I'm working on. One, a case for this being a false memory or the risk factors, listing all the risk factors that this is a false memory, and then a list of all of the things as to why it's not a false memory. And I say not a false memory instead of a true memory because I have no idea if something's true. I, and I don't say lie because I have no idea if it's a lie. So it's false memory or not false memory. And I just make a catalog of all the things for and against basically. And at the end, I read that to the lawyer I'm working with. And then I come to the conclusion as to whether or not I might be helpful for their case. And basically me being not helpful for defense means that I say, this is unlikely to be a false memory or that I don't see any evidence here that a false memory has occurred. Finally, um, personal hazards, two, two last things and then your questions. The personal hazards, um, if you're interested in going into false memory research or false memory work, in particular in applied settings, remember that you're going to be watching a lot of accounts of horrible things. I watch a lot of these ABE interviews in particular, which are typically about horrific emotional experiences. And frankly, that person, especially if we're talking about false memories, is having a very tough time as a witness, whether or not this actually happened. And so you're watching people remember things in vivid detail often that are really, really, really hard to watch. And what makes it even harder to watch is that I'd say, at least in the cases that I get, about 50 to 60% of them, I come to the conclusion that there's no problem with this memory account. In other words, I don't see any indicators that this is a false memory. And so what you then realize is that you probably just watch some recount a correct story of something horrible that happened. So it's not even a false memory. Both of those, again, for the individual are horrible, but perhaps I would argue, I find it even tougher when I go, wow, yeah, that's just someone's trauma being relived. Finally though, do go into it if you feel like you can deal with that because it's really interesting and I think important work and I really enjoy doing it. And I look forward to your questions. So can false memory evidence wait a trial? Yes. Should it? Yes. If the evidence shows that you should question a memory, then it should influence the trial. Otherwise, uh, justice probably isn't being served. Um, here's my website and my Twitter and some resources that you can access if you're interested in this topic and related topics. Back to you, Jill. Okay, thanks, Julia. Do you want to move your slides? Yes. Thank you very much. That was really interesting. And um, lots of other people thought it was really interesting as well, because there's loads of questions. So let me just read some of them to you and you can um, talk about them. So the first one I'm going to ask you, because the first one was asked, is from somebody called David, who says, can PTSD create false memories? Well, that's an interesting question. I often get asked that the other way around, actually, whether false memories can create PTSD. And there seems to be evidence that yes, it can, it can. Can PTSD create false memories? I'm actually not the right person to, to answer that. Um, I'm not, I, I think that pe people with highly emotional experiences who are suffering might be more vulnerable to false memories, but that would be a trauma person who you'd probably want to ask about that rather than me. Okay. Um, so um, going on, you said something very interesting about that when you did your research, 70% of people believed falsely and 30% they probably assumed didn't. Um, are there risk factors? What is it that protects the 30% or what makes the 70% more vulnerable? I don't know. So in the study that I conducted and in other research, there have been attempts to identify personality factors. So whether things like introversion or extroversion are related to you being likely to create a false memory or not. Um, we've looked at intelligence. We've looked at um, we've looked at various different kinds of factors. Imagination, sort of create, you know, how likely people are to be creative and imagine other worlds. And um, 
none of those particularly seem to be risk factors. So I haven't found yet a particular personality that's at risk of creating a false memory. Um, I also think, and this is uh, a guess, <laughs> I'll be honest, but I, from preliminary sort of things that I was seeing, um, I think intelligence, which we assume would be a protective factor, might be a risk factor because especially combined with creativity, you might be able to tell a better story and uh, come up with reasons for why you might have done something that you didn't. So I think that things that we assume certainly we should be careful with. So I don't think intelligence is protective. Personality factors aren't protective. Um, the only thing that is somewhat reliably related is age. So it does seem to be that because it's connected with compliance, that children are more likely to go along with the situation, including leaving questions. And so they're then more likely to subsequently potentially remember things falsely because of something that particularly an adult has suggested to them. But again, there there's interview practices that we can do to, to mitigate that. In terms of false memories in general, though, the take home message should be everyone creates false memories. And as far as we can tell, every brain, that's, that's just how brains work. And so it's not a personality thing. It's a uh, situational thing. So why those 70% and why not the other 30? I think the answer is because of that particular situation and that particular memory I was trying to implant. I think 100% of the participants in that study have at some point in other circumstances created false memories, just maybe not in my particular study. Okay, thank you. That's really interesting. Um, our other questions. Katie wants to know, can false memories be reversed? They can become well, we can forget things just like real memories, but also they can become what are called non-believed memories. And so those are like my memory of my grandfather picking me up and twirling me around. That is incorrect. That's factually incorrect. And it is a false memory, but I still have it. And so you could say that it's a non-believed memory. So I, it's still there, almost like, almost like I watched a movie but a bit more, feels a bit more personal. Uh, but I know that it didn't happen. And so we can relabel memories is usually how we talk about it. It's, or forget them, but I think that's more likely. You don't really reverse them in the sense that you, you can't sort of just get rid of them as quickly as you put them in, I think. Um, but you you can relabel them. Or say that, oh, well, that couldn't have happened. I don't know why it couldn't have happened. Maybe your grandfather wasn't around at the time, but say that couldn't have happened and then begin to think, well, what did happen? Why did I, that doesn't happen. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, the, somebody um, anonymously asks, do defence lawyers use false memory syndrome to belittle vulnerable witnesses uh, and make evidence sound potentially untrue? And if they do, how can we protect them? Two parts. One, um, we don't call it false memory syndrome. Uh, that was something that was positive in the 90s as a particular thing and is not the same as just false memory. So if you're talking about memories of things that didn't happen, just call them false memories. Second, um, I mean, in terms of experts being hired, I would hope that experts have enough <laughs> morality to do their jobs properly and to just present the science and how it relates to a particular case. Uh, and that's, again, is the role of that is to educate the judge and jury on the science. And so if that changes how people perceive a particular witness statement, then that is probably a good thing because if the science influences it, then it should. But again, you have more information to make a better, uh, better decision. Whether defense lawyers sometimes use it or weaponize false memories, definitely. Um, I think at those points, it's often actually when there's not a false memory expert in the room, because false memory experts are very cautious. And I think in other contexts, sort of the, but maybe this didn't actually happen, maybe you've misremembered this as a line of questioning, definitely I've seen used um, to try and undermine a witness's credibility. And that can be really problematic, and we need to be very careful. Um, but again, that's a judge's role to also potentially stop that kind of line of questioning if it's getting out of control. And you think so, so I think, be. yeah, they ought to be. They ought to be stopped in those kinds of questioning. And um, somebody similarly is asking, uh, actually, it's the same person called Maddie. Do you think even the mention of false memories may bias juniors, regardless of what the witness of what the um, expert says? Oh, I'm not sure I understand the question, but I'm going to assume that um, what you mean is whether 
bringing up false memories in a courtroom is already going to get people thinking about false memories. I think people should always be thinking about false memories. I think that is something that we should consider in every case where there is a memory involved. And it might be the point that you just dismiss that very quickly, just like you might dismiss that something is a lie very quickly. But I think that we should always consider that at least briefly. And so I don't, I mean, it might, bias, I think, is a strong word. It might influence how people consider a piece of evidence, but I think that it is an important part of evaluating that piece of evidence. So I think it's a good thing. Good. And uh, somebody says, if a person, I'm just running through them because so many and we haven't got much time. If a person fully believes a false memory, can this impact the results of a lie, a lie detector test? We don't really know, but probably I would. I mean, lie detectors have their own set of faults already. Yeah. But if someone believes that something happened to them, certainly in theory, they sh should pass a lie detector test because they're not lying. And so things that we rely on for a lie wouldn't manifest. So, yes, they should be able to pass a lie detector test. Yeah, it's they would be hyper aroused by, by it. Yes. Correct. Uh, so somebody else asked. Are false members uh, false memories like the Dunning Kruger effect? Um, I don't know what that was, so I googled it. Um, uh, you probably do, but just for other people who don't, it's a cognitive bias, so that people with limited knowledge or competence in an intellectual or social domain think think they have much better uh, competence in such a domain. And, and sometimes some people think it's the other way around that people with high competence might underestimate themselves. But do you think memories? Uh, but do you think this effect can, in, yeah, can impact by, uh, do you think it works by being made aware that something is a false memory? <laughs> Probably. I think I underestimate. I'm, I'm less confident than I should be in some of my memories because I know too much about memories <laughs> and I'm yeah. always worried about them. And I'm, I would strongly argue that people who don't understand how fallible memories are assume too strongly that theirs are correct compared to people who are more more cautious. Oh, yeah, that seems to make sense. Um, Paul Chambers says, do you advocate the use of self-administered reporting um, in a criminal investigation, even if it's a traumatic experience? Oh, that's a good question. I think that everybody should, in an ideal world, record their memories independently as soon as possible after something happened before talking to others in the first instance, that would be the dream. <laughs> yeah. Also because then as a memory expert, I could look at the closest to the original and see if it's changed. Because for to, to monitor change, you need to see multiple versions of an account. And so that would be a good thing. And I think if that involves self-administering interviews, which it probably would, then yes, the answer would be in a, in a dream world, people would take their own statement basically through something like, and maybe a chat bot or something that helps them you know, ask the right questions, give the right information, and just record it as quickly as possible. And then subsequently do a police interview that might dig deeper, but at least they have that sort of raw memory recorded. What do you think, Jill? Yes, I think it's a good idea. Um, I think maybe uh, it would be encouragement for police or lawyers, as soon as somebody is a victim, um, to say to them, now write down, tell us, write down or tell us as much as you can, but they, they don't need, you know, it doesn't need to be an official thing, write down as much as you can remember. And I was very, I noticed that with patients' notes, that I sort of think I remember about them, and I, I do remember about them, but when I go back, what I wrote at that minute is richer and more colourful than what I remember. Um, and it's really quite surprising how much of the detail goes um when you uh, uh, afterwards it's not and that's something I, there's no reason i'm not rethinking about it. no reason to embellish but things go um and that's a, a so even if you don't have false memories you the loss of memory i think is very striking in somebody with a normal a normal memory i think we're just about there and we have to stop and um uh, now, it's been really interesting and really fun hearing you. I thank the audience for participating and, and particularly thank you, Julia. That, um, I really enjoyed seeing you and hearing you. Um, there's another lunch hour ne uh, lecture next week on Tuesday, 22nd of February.
um, that isn't next week, that must be two weeks, uh, on imagining the home of the future. And that brings to, together the diverse voices who helped create the story behind the uh, tomorrow's home. So you'll all be welcome to that and it will be advertised in the UCL website. But meanwhile, uh, we can't see the audience, but you can see us. So maybe we could all clap, Julia. And uh, bye and thank you. We're going to close the event. Thank you. Thank you.